Since my father's passing a year ago, our family has received an outpouring of love and condolences. I'd have to say that it's only now, a year on, that I truly understand what an impact his life has made on the Methodist Church, on his students, on his colleagues, on those that listen to him preach and read his books, and simply on those that he met during the day to day of his life. I still haven't forgotten that moment many years ago. We were sitting at our kitchen table in Seattle. My father had been teaching at the time at SPU, and we were told that we were going to move to Dallas, Texas. It was quite an adventure. In 1985, we landed in Dallas and were graciously welcomed by then Dean James Kirby and the Perkins faculty. And so it began. This institution would become the place that he called his home for almost four decades of his life. Heavily productive decades, because my father had such a strong life purpose, along with a massive drive and energy. Waking up early every morning to read, write, and reflect. A person of deep faith, he had himself as a child been a recipient of the kindness and generosity of the Irish Methodists, people who put their faith into action. My grandfather died when my father was only four, leaving my grandmother. And who was there to provide support and comfort but the people of the Methodist Church? Their acts of kindness planted the seeds for what would eventually become a life devoted to Christian service. During this time at SMU, my father poured his energy into his intellectual work, into his students, and into the institution of Perkins itself, because he believed that institutions have to be tended to and cultivated, all in support of an environment where excellence and inquiry can thrive and survive over generations. His scholarly work was very important to him, but he was multidimensional and practical. There were numerous lectures and conferences, the international missionary work, the preaching, the weddings and the funerals, some held here, right in Perkins Chapel. And then he also led two Sunday school classes at Highland Park in this room for over 30 years. For his students, my father provided an intangible and unquantifiable service, that of delivering wisdom, or at least pointing in the right direction. He always had time for his students. He advised, challenged, and guided them. He wanted his students to develop intellectual curiosity, 
see in, in the program for today that there's going to be a reception following the lecture today over in Bridwell Library. Uh, we would be delighted to have you join us uh, for that and also as an opportunity to uh, express your appreciation uh, and appreciation on behalf of all of us to Siobhan uh, for being with us today and for all the gifts that she has brought through her father to this place. I'm also happy. Someday I'm not going to talk like this, I swear. I'm also happy to welcome uh, William Bill Millard. Uh, Bill is a twice over SMU graduate and a longtime member of the Highland Park United Methodist Church, where he faithfully attended the In His Steps adult Sunday school class that Professor Abraham led for so many years. Uh, Bill said that he has accumulated a collection of 10 expansive volumes of journal notes he took in those classes over two decades. Bill is also the sponsor of this morning's lecture for which we are deeply grateful. Thank you, Bill. Uh, Bill Millard serves as a board member of the Salt and Light Foundation, which was created by Billy Abraham and actively supports the work Billy so energetically and effectively pursued in Romania. It is in that capacity as a board member of Salt and Light uh, that I invite Bill now to say a few words to us. Bill Millard.
perhaps even in spite of the evidence or without considering the evidential factors of the Christian faith. So that was one option that clearly both of them were not going to sign on to. And then the other was what I call hard rationalism, or what Billy actually called in print hard rationalism. A belief is rational if and only if it can be articulated or demonstrated formally. Or another way of putting it is a belief is true if and only if it can be convincing to any reasonable person. So these were the two options. You're either a theodist or a hard rationalist. And Billy and, and Newman presumed to offer a third option, which Billy in print calls soft rationalism. The elements of soft rationalism include the willingness to subject faith to rational analysis, the informal and convergent nature of reasoning, and the irreducible role that judgment plays in evaluating evidence and forming arguments. So this is the position that I'm going to spell out in just a bit, even more. As Billy points out, the word soft does not suggest, I love this, woolly-mindedness. I can imagine him saying that, woolly-mindedness, or shallow thinking on the part of its proponents. It simply mediates between the positions of theism and hard rationalism to find a third alternative. Soft rationalism in this sense then, quote, retains the role for evidence and argument while also assigning cognitive significance to personal, effectively toned experience. So in other words, evidence is not merely arguments. Evidence can be experience-based insofar as you consider what's going to be fundamentally important to faith. It is essentially, for Billy particularly, a claim about the kind of argument that should take place in debates about the significance of religious beliefs. Soft rationalism attempts to lay bare the general character of the arguments which really make sense of the kind of disputes which take place between believers and non-believers. In other words, when you're having a conversation between believers and non-believers, there has to be some basis for that conversation lest you start begging the question by merely appealing to authority or merely appealing to your assertions. There has to be some evidence for your claim. So in this sense, soft rationalism emphasizes the role of reason in critically evaluating religious beliefs, but does not require conclusive evidence, meaning two intelligent people could come at the issue, see the issue differently, spell out their arguments, and without assuming conclusive evidence would be a necessary condition to being rational. That is, we should strive to make plausible a case for our religious belief. And we should have grounds for our faith, right? However, convincing all is, again, not necessar a necessary condition for being rational. So let me say a bit more about these three aspects of soft rationalism. The first, as I've mentioned, is that faith is not exempt from rational scrutiny. The claims of faith for both Billy and Newman are subject to rational evaluation. And I loved what Siobhan said this morning because this was no doubt in print, but in his own interaction with living human beings, the following would be a clear statement of Billy's commitment. Characteristics like openness to evidence, intellectual honesty, intellectual humility, rigor, and so on, are directed to the, quote, proper formation, maintenance, communication, application, and revision of our beliefs. That is, our beliefs are subject to revision. And if anyone knew Billy, you knew that he was open to having his beliefs challenged and revised. But he was also clear in articulating those beliefs in such a strong way that if you weren't careful, you might think he was closed-minded. Contrary to that, my assumption and experience was he was very open-minded, but he was also tenacious, which is a virtue. Wish we had more tenacity. 
Though faith is, quote, I'm going to quote Newman now, is the simple lifting of the mind to the unseen God without conscious reasoning or formal argument, still the mind may be allowably, nay, religiously engaged in reflecting upon its own faith, investigating the grounds and the object of faith, bringing it out in words, whether to defend or recommend or teach the faith to others. So clearly Newman and Billy in this sense agree that faith is subject to evaluation and that grounds for faith are going to be important. Newman again makes a distinction between simple and complex assent. Simple assent is often unconscious and even automatic. We do this all the time. We call this automaticity in cognitive science now, that we, our, our brains work so quickly that we're not fully aware of all that's being taken in. Newman said this not with cognitive science in mind, but just a sort of distinction between explicit and implicit reasoning that happens when we come to believe. That is, propositions pass before us and receive our assent without our consciousness and without a recognition of the grounds of a particular simple assent. However, the distinction between simple and complex ascent is not that the former is necessarily groundless and the latter grounded, rather it is that the simple ascent does not require reflexive endorsement of the grounds while complex ascent does. Newman recognizes that not all simple ascents are necessarily truth conducive, meaning sometimes you can have false beliefs. Some may be, quote, merely expressions of our personal likings, tastes, principles, motives, and opinions. In this sense, the process of reflection might correct a simple assent. I mean, if we had to, just footnote, if we had to monitor all that we think today, I guarantee you'd be taking a nap pretty quickly. Right, because the, the way the brain work is, is so quick and automatic, and what we try to do is represent that right after the fact, and that's what Newman's pointing out. Abraham likewise draws attention to the difference, for example, between divine revelation and the means by which we gain access to revelation. Such a distinction presupposes that divine revelation is antecedent to and distinct from that which it bears witness to. So there's divine revelation, and then there's the transmission and reception of divine revelation. In other words, the event, manifestation, or speech act of divine revelation at a particular time is distinct from the process by which it is recognized and appropriated. And I think this was a clear indicator to some, uh, kind of a scratching of the head moment. Was Billy distinguishing scripture from revelation? you better believe it. And he did it for epistemic reasons. Instead, and I'm going to explain now, instead of retreating to a quote, mere confession or confessional circle of faith, end of quote, or appealing to authority, Abraham contends that we need quote, sophisticated public discussion that tackles rival claims to possession of divine revelation with sensitivity and thoroughness, end of quote. Revelation, he adds, quote, calls for a deepening of our epistemological reflection, and so we are challenged to provide the conceptual horizons that will permit the full range of questions and resolution that fragile human beings pursue within and without the area or arena of religion. So for example, Billy thought it was important for people, believer and non-believer, to come together and duke it out and to really seriously question the credentials for divine revelation. That doesn't sound like a fedius to me. Seri let me add, serious mistakes have been made in the past explorations of the full contours of human, of, of divine revelation. Facile solutions on the relation between revelation and science have been offered and found wanting. The way to deal with these is to revisit the terrain, find out what went wrong, and go back to our intellectual labors. One more piece. We have the logical space to inquire whether, in fact, we have crossed 
into the new world of divine revelation. Or been taken for a ride by a false prophet. I love this next one. A bogus agent of God. The notion of taking a leap in the dark or into the abyss much too readily overlooks the clear intellectual dangers of an overused metaphor. Undergirding Abraham's account, then, is the distinction between, and, and I'm going to use the language and try to clarify, the soteriological, that is, being initiated into the life of God. People come to church, they accept the gospel, they become believers, they're initiated into the life of God. They can do that without doing epistemology. But he also articulated the epistemological aspects of the Christian faith. That is to say, the conditions under which claims to knowledge are in fact the case. In making such a distinction, because you might wonder if he's trying to get out of trouble here, in, in, in trying to make this distinction that he's exempting faith from criticism, quite the contrary. He's simply saying that the task of the church, the primary task of the church, Bill, that you articulated just a while ago, is not to provide a full-blown epistemology to join the ranks of the, of, of the believers. You do not have to come to the door and test to find out if you get a passing grade on your epistemology. In other words, the church should not drop everything, for example, preaching the gospel, initiating people into the faith, until it develops a theory of justification and knowledge. However, such a caveat does not suggest that the aim of justifying Christian belief or determining whether Christian claims constitute knowledge is irrelevant to or incompatible with Christian faith. In fact, Billy's argument is that Christian tradition encourages rather than inhibits the kind of pursuit that he's describing. That's why I got interested in Newman. I, when I went to graduate school, I was taught the Bible was really central until I realized philosophically I was in trouble. And it was because of Billy and many others that I got to see in the Christian tradition ways in which to map out questions that really were more of a second order kind of reflection. Newman makes a comparable distinction between the original process of reasoning and the process of investigating our reasonings and thus argues that faith is a spontaneous, tacit, or informal kind of reasoning. The exercise of analysis is not necessary to the integrity of the process analyzed. The process of reasoning is complete in itself and independent. The analysis is but, a, but an account of it, and it does not make the, collect, the, the conclusion correct. Meaning, Newman thinks that as we implicitly reason about matters, that is rational. But when we want to sort of check on that process, we're not making it more rational, at least in the original sense of the word. We're trying to figure out whether our reasoning can be justified retrospectively. Faith, then, is not divorced from reason. But, my, but, mo, but like most of our beliefs, it involves a kind of implicit reasoning. Newman, for the lack of, to, to sort of get to the point, Newman offers what we call a parity argument, which is to say if you were to look at how people reason in other aspects of life, like journalism, politics, morality, you would find out, and I'm, I'm going to quote uh, Newman on this point, uh, that most people, there's ample evidence, Newman argues, that most people operate on the level of implicit reasoning until probabilities fail. What he means by that is we have experiences that lead us to believe that it's, like for example, how many of you believe right now that you're hearing what I'm saying? Right, you don't have to go through a, a, a philosophical test to figure out that you can trust your faculties, right? Unless you were a brain in a vat or something like that, if we were going to do a philosophical thought experiment, what if you were all brains in a vat, right, or something like that? But we don't do that, right? We, we, what do we do? We, we, we go with what we have until we're shown otherwise, right? So what Newman tries to show that faith is, quote, not the only exercise of reason, which when critically examined would be called unreasonable and yet is not so. 
So the first, uh, the first feature of soft rationalism is that faith is not exempt from criticism. And in fact, faith is a kind of reasoning of some sort, probably a tacit, implicit kind of reason. And I think Billy and, and Newman certainly different, but would share that assumption. The second is the recognition that religious belief ought to be evaluated as a, quote, rounded whole rather than taken in stark isolation, end of quote. A religious worldview, according to Billy, is a, quote, complex, large-scale system of belief that must be viewed as a whole before it is evaluated, end of quote. In determining whether a belief is rational, then, we consider various pieces of evidence instead of relying on one piece alone, and thereby seek to offer what Billy describes as a cumulative case argument. The claim here is that, quote, what is being supported rationally is a whole cluster of beliefs which hang together and which need to be evaluated not just in isolation, but as a whole, end of quote. Newman illustrates the cumulative and informal nature of reasoning with the example of a cable. A cable is composed of several strands. Individually, each is weak and insufficient to support a belief, but collectively they are as sufficient as an iron rod. The cable symbolizes an assemblage of probabilities, separately insufficient for certainty, but when put together, irrefragable. People who refuse to depend on the durability of a cable and demand an iron bar would in certain given cases be irrational and unreasonable. If you were hanging off of a cliff, right, you're barely hanging on and I throw a cable at you, you go, not enough. So, so, so Newman's point is the cable is sufficient. It's not equivalent to the iron bar, but it's sufficient, cumulatively. Newman then seems to argue that demonstration is not necessary. I don't think he would say it's unimportant. Not necessary for a belief being rational. Beliefs are cumulatively the result of a, a wide ranging of probabilities when brought together function kind of like the cable. Abraham likewise rejects a narrowly construed evidentialism, but not evidentialism per se. The evidentialism that Billy rejects is the following, that the claim that the only kind of reasoning that is relevant is a sort that can be put in terms of proof or statistical probability. Plenty of students in my philosophy classes all start out the semester by saying, proof, proof, proof. And I have to challenge them to say, what do you mean by that? Do you mean that I can't believe that there's an external world without proving it? Good reasons to think there's an external world. Right? Good reasons to think I was born, good reasons to think I'm going to die, but these are not demonstrations, and yet they're reasonable. So the mistake, according to Billy, is to bet the farm, I love this expression, on a very, very narrow range of evidentiary support. In fact, we quote, regularly depend on cumulative case arguments and on irreducible personal judgments to find our way from darkness to light in settings from literary exegesis through history, to natural science, and most certainly in philosophy. If you got philosophers together, materialists and dualists, and they lay out their positions, it seems to me they're pretty reasonable. The question is, do they have to conclude and prove their points to be reasonable? Certainly we want to follow the arguments and see which ones stack up, which ones make the best sense, and, you know, inference the best explanation of the data, absolutely. But that's a, more of a cumulative case argument than it is a demonstration. So Newman says there are two ways in which we can think of evidence, for example. Evidence is public arguments that anyone could accept and evidence in the sense of first person reasons, which are often implicit rather than explicit. That is, Newman distinguishes between the evidential considerations in the formation of faith, that is why we come to believe in God as we have, and the articulation of those reasons in a publicly accessible manner. As he says, the evidences are for public disputations, lectures, and so on in the schools. But the faith and reason of which I speak are subjective, private, personal, and unscientific. 
the mental acts of every Christian whatever, except when they are merely hereditary and mechanical and therefore unworthy of the name, are what Newman is describing. This then is the thesis which I shall make the occasion of an essay upon the nature of the personal evidence on which the mass of Christians individually believe. This is the, this is the sort of antecedent to the grammar of assent, in which Newman is trying to demonstrate two propositions. One, I can believe things without fully understanding them and be rational in believing those. Two, I can believe things without demonstrating them and be rational in believing those. So it's possible to be rational without demonstration. Newman's lifetime insistence or lifelong insistence was that there are reasons for faith, but that such reasons need not consist in publicly available evidence or arguments. Now you have to remember he was taught by Richard Waitley who wrote the standard textbook in logic at Oxford University. So Newman understood arguments, he understood the importance of arguments, but his point was arguments are not the only kind of evidence that we would consider when we come to believe in God or anything. As we've seen, Newman and Abraham emphasized the informal nature of reasoning and the ways in which our reasoning is shaped by antecedent considerations. Our reasoning proceeds from, quote, starting points and with collateral aids not formally proved, but more or less assumed the process of assumption lying in the action of the illit of sense as applied to primary elements of thought respectively congenial to the people at hand. End of quote. That's from the grammar of assent. Abraham makes a comparable point regarding the nature of revelation as what he calls a threshold experience. Quote, embracing revelation is like entering a whole new world, so that as you look back, you are forced to re-describe what you had seen previously. Coming to believe in divine revelation is not just a matter of adding one more piece of evidence to your appeal of evidence or your canon of evidence. It makes a difference to the way you read the other evidence available to you. So I see a sort of common ground again between Newman and Billy on the extent to which our evidence comes together in a cumulative fashion. And there are certain variables that when you add to that are going to make a difference. So if you're, if you're a non-theist or an atheist, you are not going to see divine revelation as an important part of your evidence, right? Precisely Newman's point. Newman's, in fact, Newman got in trouble. He said, if it weren't for divine revelation, I'd be an atheist. But when you factor divine revelation into your worldview, things look differently, right? So here's, in philosophy now, philosophers have discovered we have a problem of disagreement. How do we make sense of two equally intelligent people with access to evidence, and why is it that they disagree? Well, I think Newman's explanation and Billy's explanation is because they're not operating with the exact same variables. And, and this is gonna be the last point. The way in which we weigh evidence is going to differ depending on the variables that we add into our evidential considerations. Okay, this is the third point. The third and related feature of soft rationalism is the irreducible role that judgment plays in weighing various pieces of evidence in seeing the interrelatedness of diverse and complex considerations that go into the assessment of beliefs and determining which of these considerations are significant and relevant to the particular issue at hand. Abraham thinks that cumulative case arguments invariably involve this kind of judgment. We cannot eradicate this necessary element in the adjudication of what is at stake. Figuring out, for example, what counts as or summarizing what, quote, constitutes Christianity is itself a major theological exercise which depends in part on a judgment as to what is and is not rationally acceptable, end of quote. As Abraham points out, this kind of reasoning is not unique to religion. Newman likewise makes the parody argument, as I've mentioned. Disputes in other fields of knowledge, history, literary exegesis, philosophy, jurisprudence require a kind of informal reasoning, judgments of plausibility, and an irreducible element of personal judgment, which can be trained and rendered more sensitive. Hence the title of my book, Communities of Informed Judgment. 
The appeal to judgment is not some personal feeling or some new kind of evidence which somehow adds extra weight to the whole. Instead, the emphasis is placed on how evidence is recognized and weighed in the scales of rational evaluation. Newman accordingly argues, you might say, man, this, this guy's cooking the books, right? Uh, it's amazing the parallel on this particular issue between Billy and Newman. And I, I don't know of anyone that's really actually done this kind of comparative analysis, and, and, and I just started working on it, and it's extraordinary. I, my sneaking suspicion is Basil Mitchell is somewhere in the background here. Newman accordingly argues that we have a, new, a natural, illative, okay, don't worry about it, <laughs> or inductive sense. I think that's what Newman referred, Alatio, like Locke and others, Alatio just means some kind of inferential process, some process in which I'm deriving from antecedent experiences conclusions, but not in a formal way, okay? We have the capacity, Newman says, to form beliefs based on broad scale inductions from numerous and disparate lines of evidence. The illative sense is not some secret spiritual sense that is added to our nature, but rather it is a natural endowment, just like memory, sense perception, and so on. Though a natural aspect or basic aspect of our existence, the illative sense also needs to be trained, developed, and perfected. Um, I know this firsthand, when my son was born, he was born with a malformed retina in his left eye. We went to two specialists. They diagnosed him differently. And this is when I was writing my dissertation. And of course, it's a tragic experience, but in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, how did they come to different conclusions? They're both specialists. You know, you might think, well, that was awfully insensitive to me. I couldn't help it, right? As I was writing this dissertation, and I'm, I'm trying to struggle to make sense of what's going on in my, my son's life. But I also thought, somebody has informed judgment. And here it just happens, Dr. Patel was right. He has PHPV. And after, upon further reflection, I recognized that judgment was clearly operative in the diagnosis. Without doing exact calculations, our minds are capable of summing up a great deal of evidence, as Newman points out. Let me long quote here. Nor again is it by any diagram that we are able to scrutinize, sort, and combine the many premises which must be first run together before we answer duly a question. It is the living mind that we must look for the means of using correctly principles of whatever kind, facts or doctrines, experiences or testimonies, true or probable, and of discerning what conclusion from these is necessary, suitable, or expedient when they are taken for granted. And this, either by means of a natural gift, meaning you just have brute natural capacity to make sense, or from mental formation in practice and a long familiarity with those various starting points. Newman also quotes famous line from Aristotle that when we're wanting to learn, what we, what we inevitably do is we defer to those who have gone before us, right? Those that have the kind of phrenesis, uh, the kind of practical wisdom. So in this sense, Newman is saying the illative sense provides a, quote, mental comprehension of various pieces of data reflecting a clear and rapid act of the intellect, always, however, by an unwritten summing up. Sometimes Newman overstates his point, okay? I think sometimes it's not just unwritten, I, I, but I think his point is sometimes the judgments we make are so tacit and so beyond our full awareness. Benjamin Lightman did an experiment on this years ago in which he showed the difference between our brain and our ability to sort of hone in on to what's actually happening, as I mentioned before. Okay, I have another long quote that I'm going to skip for the, t for the sake of time. Well, of course, Billy was deeply worried about this last point on judgment because a lot of pushback on Basil Mitchell was his sort of soft rationalism essentially led to this kind of idea that really what he's talking about is feeling or intuition. It's not rational. It's just a gut reaction, right? 
So Billy anticipates and then takes up some of these objections. Appealing to judgment, for example, may be subject to the charge of subjectivism or confirmation bias. We see what we want to see, right? Gut reaction. In one sense, the issue to me and Billy, I think, comes down to the matter of reliability. That is, what matters is whether the employment of our judgment increases rather than decreases true rather than false beliefs. Back to the example of the retina specialist, right? We're going to, I mean, in some sense, it was based on scientific examination, scientific scrutiny, but in some sense, it's also probably based on informed judgment from accumulation of experiences of training and, and all those kinds of considerations that we, that we have in mind. Second, judgment does not entail, Billy expression, feeling by, or flying by feel. That's the way he put it. Um, the argument is not based on anything but those particular considerations which when taken as a whole constitute the total case which can be made out. So in other words, there's something cognitive going on when we make judgments. Third, the possibility of being biased and so on does not necessarily entail that one will always be biased or that one will always be adversely influenced by prejudice, bias, and so on. It just means it's possible, right? And you have to have safeguards against um, a judgment in this case. Fourth, judgment carried out by the network of intellectual skills and arts to be found in those fields of inquiry that are relevant to the various considerations to which we appeal and are made also seem to be safeguards, meaning when you go into academics, what are we looking for? when people start summing up arguments, when people make judgments. We want to make sure that they're thoughtful. We want to make sure that they're rigorous. We want to make sure they're clear. We want to so in other words, this appeal to judgment is not divorced from the kind of intellectual skills that one would be required to have in the field, uh, whatever field they're working in. William Wainwright argues that Newman and perhaps Abraham provide clues to ascertaining in what sense judgment can be reliable. Well, what do we do when we have judgments? We want to compare those with other judgments, right? We want to see if, in fact, our judgments line up with the judgments of others. And just because we don't have a consensus doesn't mean that we can't come to any conclusion. It just means we don't have a consensus. In fact, a failure to secure substantial agreement may simply indicate that one's powers are being used idiosyncratically. Okay, conclusion. So what I've tried to do in this talk briefly, I hope, is to show, and there's a lot more there, but I thought this is what I want to say today. Um, and I'm hoping to develop this in, in greater detail. What I wanted to show is that I think if you had, again, chance, my, one of my former students is here, and I want to be alert to the fact that in the literature currently, people are redefining terms like fideism, rationalism. There's even now a, 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 an opinion called quasi fideism And in fact, I just read an article trying to respond to the claim that Newman's a quasi fideist So a quasi fideist is one who is allowing faith to be subject to reason, but our starting points are groundless. And this, apl this applies not only to belief, but non-belief. Um, Duncan Pritchard, a philosopher, has just written two or three articles on this to show that Newman may be a quasi fideus uh, maybe a Wittgensteinian quasi fideus uh, I won't say much today about that. Newman and Abraham fit the description, in my mind, up to this point as a soft rationalist. First, they argue that faith is not exempt from rational valuation. Second, faith, like other domains of inquiry, employs an informal and cumulative kind of reasoning. Third, judgment plays an indispensable role in weighing and evaluating evidence. As a result, they do not reject the claims of reason as such, but demand a subtler appreciation of the way reason works, not only in relation to religious truth, but also in respects of other aspects of life. So a few words just about uh, maybe some things that I would think would be important in honor of Billy's legacy is to put what he has worked on here in conversation now with the literature 
on the nature of faith, the nature of reason, and how they're related, and perhaps maybe, maybe even put him in dialogue with the uh, current work being done on the parity argument, the argument that faith is a kind of reasoning like other aspects of life that works on this tacit and implicit level. Thank you very much. I think that's really helpful. Uh, he and I had many conversations at La Madeleine. Uh, at one point I told my, I thought, do they have a back room for you? <laughs> you know, because that was a pretty famous place for him, an important place. I think this is where Newman and, and Billy differ to some extent. Newman was not allergic to natural theology in general, but he was allergic to the kind of Paley style of natural theology, whereas I think Billy was trained as a philosopher first and a theolo theologian second. I think for Billy, that's why his introduction to philosophy of religion would say, if your question is more generally framed, you, this is where natural theology comes in, you're, you're going to make cumulative case arguments. And I think his point would be, lay it out. And we'll see if the, in the, in the, in the uh, Crossing the Threshold book, he actually has a chapter on conversion and deconversion, that he thinks it's conceivable upon reflection, employing natural theology, for one to find out maybe, because he's going to grant prima facie status to that experience. He's not going to say, he's not going to be a skeptic and say, I can't accept that. He's going to accept it, but he's going to want to see how that fits together with a whole lot of other considerations. So I think in that sense, he and Newman are slightly different. Different time period, Billy went through the Oxford program where Basil Mitchell did more of an informal natural theology in contrast to Swinburne, both at Oxford, but I think Billy, there's actually a book on this showing Billy's connection to uh, Mitchell. So in that sense, I think, lay it out. Uh, let's, let's see where that goes and um, let's see if there are any overriders or defeaters to your claim. 
So I, in fact, he had friends that were not Christian that he regularly would uh, have conversations about Islamic, Jewish, other, other faiths or he was, this is what I don't think has been put in print. Uh, just because he was strongly committed as a Christian doesn't mean he thought we should play uh, unfairly on our team. I mean, I think in some sense, to be honestly honest, he would have to consider the claim. And he also, when I first met him, described himself as a pietist, rationalist, supernaturalist, right? A really wild combination of considerations. So I, I, I wouldn't see him throwing this out initially. Does, does that help? Yes, thank you. Yeah. Yes, there's a question back there. So you're now asking me a question that's slightly out of my area, but I'll, I'll, t I'll take a shot because I, I, I have to say I spent a long time with him and I think I can speak to that at least experientially. Um, I don't think Billy thought it as, of evangelism as you go out there, you preach the gospel, you kind of cram it down people's throats, uh, but at the same time, unapologetically, you, you, uh, you make your claims without apology, without, you know, any sort of trepidation. So I think he would say, of course, missionary work, just like the early church, started out with people just in some really willy-nilly robust fashion uh, acting on what they experienced, right? Back to Ruben's question. But retrospectively, I think he would want to make sure missionaries have somebody, either the missionary him or herself or someone who can come in and create contexts in which uh, people outside the Christian tradition don't see this as begging the question. So I don't think he would say evangelism is uh, kind of an authoritarian um, in, in employment of beliefs, right? It's, it's actually making claims. Have, you know, you have a threshold experience, or at least you're appealing to some threshold experience that somebody else had. And so I, I don't think he would say that's um, inherently at odds with mission work. I think most missionaries have confirmed that to me. The reason they like the logic of evangelism, A, is that the word logic is in the title. The logic of evangelism, right? There's something rational about it. Other questions? And it can be objections. I have no problems with objections. Yes? Yeah, and I thought someone would ask that question. I'm actually writing an article uh, with a philosopher on, on the illative sense. And the problem is Newman uses a lot of different words to describe its activity. So on one, on one hand, he says it's comparable to phronesis, except it's not restricted to morality. So unlike Aristotle, it's not just about the moral life. So that's one part of it. There's clearly something rational about it. He refers to it as a faculty of reason or a faculty of re the process of reasoning. And he argues that it's involved in the middle, the beginning, middle, and end of arguments. It also is involved in sanctioning through judgment the conclusion of, from inferences. So, so it is interesting he used the word illative and sense. In uh, cognitive, lit cognitive science now, we call this you'll have to excuse the language, cognitive penetration. 
That's the language that's used. And what they mean by that is the perceptual and the rational are distinguishable, but when they come together, they're so intertwined that it's possible that your antecedent desires, capacities are actually entailed in your perceiving an object. And in a sense, I think Newman is saying something like that. Like perception, we can see immediately things but he also thinks there's something inferentially going on in the background of your mind. You may not be aware of it. So the book Blink, I don't know if you remember Malcolm Gladwell's book, the, the, the book Blink, that came out when I was writing my dissertation. That's kind of close, except for Newman thinks there is some inferent, it's not just intuition or gut reaction or, or, or perceptual, there is some sort of rational component. That's a lot to digest, does that make sense? Okay. I'll be glad to send that to you after I, uh, we're, we're trying to figure that out. Hey, Steve. Thank you very much. I have a twofold question. Um, first, the consequences of the similarity between the Newman and Newman and Newman is that the Newman is more Okay, so the first question is, uh, how do we make sense of the connection given that Billy and Newman end up in different places? Is that fair? Um, Newman himself, in Development of Doctrine, makes it very clear that what he's doing is he's giving a retrospective analysis of the development of doctrine. And there are indicators that he criteria, if you want to say, that he's appealing to to make sense of it, but he says, this is presumptive. It's got him in trouble in Rome. Because he, he basically wants to say, this is, this is probabilistic, right? That's as good as it gets. So Newman and Billy are looking at the Christian tradition retrospectively, and they're disagreeing on the conclusion. I think it's just maybe not as simple as that. That's what I think is happening. I also know probably in terms of their upbringing, that's making a difference. There's a real, in fact, contrarian aspect here, right? We're, 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 we're not going to trust authority in quite the same way. And Newman got in trouble for this uh, with some of his Oxford buddies. They said, you're just... You're just begging the question by appealing to authority. And I think that was a little slightly overstated way. But at the same time, there are times where Newman, he gets a little loose and says some things that I would say if I were his friend, please don't say that. <laughs> so that, that's, that's the way I would make the, I mean, this makes sense of the, what I would call fallibilist. Actually, I just argued that Newman's an epistemic fallibilist. There's no way you can get credence level one from probabilities. So both of them are looking at, with various variables and considerations, and I, see, I think that's partly, partly my explanation. And then the second question is, what kind of cognitive goods do you get as a result of judgment? I don't think Newman would say judgment is primarily about actions. I think he would say certainly would be a part of it, right? Um, in, in the sense that Aristotle says that. But I think Newman's wanting to say, look, when we're making decisions on what to believe, there are going to be considerations that factor into that. And there is going to be some judgment that, that combines the propositions. Maybe a way of thinking about it is, Steve, that maybe what Newman's describing is a kind of understanding. There are degrees of understanding, degrees of uh, considerations. I don't think I would say it's knowledge because uh, it seems to me there are multiple states that Newman's describing, and he seems to think there are multiple levels of judgment. I'm still trying to figure that one out, too, because the judgment stuff is, is trickier than the, the, the informal reasoning. But there's some work that's being done on that now, if, if that's helpful. 
Thanks for your questions. Yeah. Right, I, and this is where I think, as I said, the, the class about a year ago, I'll try not to repeat myself, this is where I think Billy was simply wanting to say, if explicit awareness is a precondition to being a Christian, that's not, that's not going to fly, that God can be doing things independently of our cognitive awareness, and Newman certainly seems to say that. But at the same time, there are people that call themselves externalists in epistemology who would argue that I can know P without knowing why I know P. So I don't know why that's not epistemic, right? I think what Billy's wanting to do is kind of pull them apart, and I think he's wanting to say something like this. When we get into theorizing more explicitly, right, that's not what Christian discipleship initially is about. And the church should get on with its business, and theologians should do theology without trying to do epistemology. And if you're going to do epistemology, and I will say this, I can say this because I was the co-editor of the Epistemology of Theology Handbook. When we did that, we were asking people who knew the discipline of epistemology, who knew about theories of knowledge, who knew about theories of justification, theories of rationality. So I think, Billy, if I were going to upgrade, update, uh, I would say probably that distinction at times can be slightly confusing, problematic, especially if you're an externalist, which is precisely saying, I don't have to know why I know in order to know. And actually, Billy does say that in Canonized Criterion. He does say that people know God, and, and, but, but then he wants to make this distinction, but they're not theorizing. They're not providing a theoretical account of knowledge or something like that. Does that help? The, so uh, I'll, I'll say one more thing. Epistemology of theology is Billy's version of prolegomena done rightly, right? Instead of theologians just kind of in a willy-nilly fashion trying to address questions that really have to be addressed in the discipline of philosophy, right, if you're going to deal with knowledge and rationality and justification, so he, he said, you go ahead and do it. <laughs> so, so that's what we did. We essentially tried to work through prolegomena like faith, reason, knowledge, justification. We even had an essay on saints, what role saints play in theology or something like that. Somebody else had their hand up. Yes.
Yeah, so on one level, this is one thing about Billy that I loved and I, I tried to catch up with him. Uh, he was extraordinarily interested in politics, big time. We would have debates, uh, not just American politics, but politics in general. And so I think he would clearly acknowledge there are starting points that are different. But one thing he would not permit was using social location as a conversation stopper. And this is what extraordinarily intrigued his students, Catholic, Anglican, various Protestants, Church of Christ, is that he saw something in the patristic tradition that transcended Rome in the Eastern Orthodox traditions. Hence, canonical theism. Now, our Roman and Orthodox friends have something to say about that, but I think this is what was intriguing about Newman, right? A Brit and an Irishman. But Newman provided through, I think, Basil Mitchell, a kind of mediation between the extremes of fideism and hard, hard rationalism. Not downplaying social location, but I think for him that would be a beginning point, not the trump card or not the basis for stopping the conversation because it would go against it, and I would, I would have held him to it. It would go against his whole principle that arguments have to be made to defend positions and evidence has to be considered and evidence only by appealing to social location is not enough. I saw the video with you and Billy uh, that they did uh, years ago, and he used to tell me about your lunches. And one of the things he really was intrigued by was your ability to like push back and to, and to question, but also question some of your own assumptions. That's what I think Billy's legacy should be known for, is not being um, partisan. I think he hated a partisan perspective. I think he despised it. He thought it was intellectually dishonest. If I can, if I can be a little Billy-esque here. He might, he might have some really stronger language to say. I think it troubled him. In fact, we read the Communist Manifesto, Paul Gavriluk, Billy and I, and we pushed him on some points. So wait a minute, there's some things in here, you know, it was fascinating to watch. And of course, his experience and Paul's experience Paul being Ukrainian, it was fascinating to watch uh, the interaction between the three of us, and I was the American who never lived in a communist structure. And I remember watching that and thinking, oh, we're not getting, we're kind of partisan at first, but I think that's not where it's ending up. Somebody else had their hand up. Chance. Yeah, good. I don't want to say they're both analytical philosophers, but I think, it, I think it's pretty common to both of them that they're going to, well, I'll say this, I've said it in print, uh, Newman's an empiricist of some sort. He wants to just look at, like in the Lockean tradition, he wants to look at how we actually reason, how we actually live, how we actually believe. I think Billy, in some sense, is sympathetic to that. I wouldn't call it phenomenology. I don't think it's a Husserlian phenomenology. I think there's certainly something descriptive, but there's also something epistemic. I mean, Newman's whole point in his response to Locke is what you call probability, Locke will never, never says you can ever have certainty as a result of probability. Newman does think there's something epistemic. As a, in other words, it's not just descriptive. There is something logical, but it's not just that, right? Because people do generally come to believe based on a set of antecedent experiences. So in the empiricist tradition, which some of my Catholic friends don't like me saying that, I don't know why, I think Newman's very much a part of the 19th century Victorian, Humean, Lockean tradition, right? The difference is he disagrees with the content of Hume 
and Locke, but he's, if you look at him on perception, for example, external world, how do we come to believe in external world? We have sensations, we infer from those sensations, we then have an object that we ascend to, the object is a mental object, namely the external world. We're not even ascending to the real world, we're ascending to that notion of an external world, which is the accumulation of experiences. I think Billy is sympathetic to that also. also. But I don't think it's just descriptive, because if it is, then we're just dealing with psychology, right? We're just dealing with describing how people believe. We don't care normatively of whether what they believe is true or false. I mean, Newman's category of simple and complex ascent shows that there has to be an, a re retroactive, reflexive endorsement of the grounds for your uh, assenting to a proposition. And I think Billy would be on, on board. But again, they're, they're, they're different insofar as Billy's a product of the Michelian Oxford movement. Newman was never viewed as a philosopher in the 19th century. And, and to this day, I think people are now starting to say, oh, hey, there's, there's stuff here to be explored. Thank you for, oh. Okay. Thanks. Uh, let, me, let me just say really briefly, I know I've said more than I should, um, this was maybe one of the hardest things to prepare for. I deeply loved Billy. He made a massive difference in my life. I think I'm here today because of him. I, um, I'm grateful. And I hope to contribute to his legacy in ways that um, I think would make him, I was asked, there was an interview, you know, these interviews they do, and I said, what would, what would he say? I think he would be in the back smirking and curious to see what I would say. I hope today I've honored him in that way. And I just wanted to say thank you for the invitation and for being here today, former students, friends, and colleagues. Thank you. Good morning. Is it still morning? I guess it is. Thank you, everyone, uh, for this wonderful opportunity. Lecture, Fred, thank you so much. Siobhan, everyone else, thank you for uh, all coming today. Uh, I just have a very quick thing to say, a quick item, and then an invitation to Bridwell, which is that when I had my interview here, I got a note from Dean Hill that said, this is your committee, and Billy Abraham was on it. And that, that, that's laughter right there, as it is, right? And I didn't know much about him, so I looked him up and I said, good God, he wrote 30 books. How am I going to prepare for this interview? So I did, and I was ready for his questions on provenient grace, but it turns out he had a conflict. So I missed that bullet, but I still got the job. So, and we, we became good friends, so thank you, Billy. Um, I want at this time to, to invite you all to Bridwell Library, which is right out the door. Take a left up the steps into that building right there uh, and through the hallway, and there will be uh, uh, space in the back in the blue room. Um, if you don't know where to go, just follow me and wherever the crowds are going. Uh, with that, thank you so much, and good to see you all today. Have a good afternoon.